care? It's a really great, great question. It turns out it's very hard to do. So instead of releasing straight from the hospital, manatees next move into rehab, which is what we do here. We don't have any veterinary staff here. Instead, we serve as a refresher course on what it's like to be a wild manatee, even though they had to go to the hospital. So even though these guys are surrounded by humans every single day, they learn very quickly that it's a huge waste of their time to approach humans. These guys, Charlie and Brandy, they are growing manatees. That means they're tacking on between one and two pounds a day right now on this herbivorous diet. So do they have any spare time? No. They're eating all day long around the clock. This guy here is finished growing. He does have some spare time. But Brandy and Charlie, they have to spend their full day munching. When they're not munching, they're napping from being so tired from munching, and then they wake up and munch some more. And that's how it goes. So we actually sink their food to the bottom using salad bars, like I threw in at the beginning of the presentation, and kale cones, as well as throw their food up in the air far away from us and have it crash on the surface. Now that not only allows us to feed our wild manatees here without using our hands, but it also encourages them to practice foraging naturally. They have to graze on their salad bars and kale cones here underneath their chins and bellies, in the exact same place they're going to find their seagrass beds out in the wild. They also have to reach up with their flexible noses and sensitive whiskers and grab food off the surface here, just like they'll have to do their coastal aquatic plants, seaweeds, and fallen mangrove leaves out in the wild. You absolutely never ever hand feed Brandy or Charlie here. In addition to it being counterproductive to our goals as a rehab facility, it's also illegal. Wild manatees are triply protected in the state of Florida, including the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. It's almost your turn. It's almost your turn. As I was saying, wild manatees are triply protected here, including the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act, both of which contain regulations against disturbing the natural behavior of a manatee. So we can't touch them, we can't feed them, talk to them, scoot them out of the way. We can't do any of that here, just like it would be illegal for us to do that out there in the rivers and oceans. For that reason, when one of our manatees, as Charlie is now, approaches the feed station when I'm feeding Snooty and I may have food in my hands, I take a couple steps back. I take my hands out of the water, I take my hands away from Snooty, and I make sure that if the two of them get into a conversation about food, which they often do with each other, that I'm not a part of that conversation and that they figure it out amongst themselves. You, do, you guys did just witness Snooty being a little impatient with that. <laughs> However, right, the two manatees that we have here for rehab, I mentioned that they're both juveniles. We have Brandy, whose head you can see, and Charlie, whose whole little body you can see. They are both orphans. We presume that both mothers were struck by a boat. We know that for sure about Charlie's mother. We're just guessing about Brandy's mother. Brandy was found stranded all by herself with an injury. Has anyone gotten a chance to see the injury of Brandy? On her tail. On her tail. Anyone have an idea what that might be? Boat. No, it's actually not boat strike. When we see boat propeller stick manatees, they make perfect straight parallel slice marks. It's called a corkscrew scar. It's very easy to recognize. And in fact, the scarring on Brandy's tail are two upside down Y shapes that follow the natural growth pattern of both cartilage and muscle in that tail. Anyone have another guess? Shark. No, not sharks. Sharks actually don't attack manatees in the wild. Anybody else? Fishing line. Fishing line might be a good guess. In fact, what we see on Brandy's tail is scarring from frostbite. Manatees are herbivores. They're herbivores, so unlike other marine mammals who are eating oily fish and crustaceans, these guys do not have a blubber layer. They don't have a big, thick, fat layer underneath that skin that's keeping in all their warm bloodedness. That means that anything below 68 degrees Fahrenheit in the water is going to be potentially fatal for a manatee. One of a mother manatee's main jobs is to teach her calf as it's growing for at least two years how to find warm water resources in order to survive the winters here, which can be deadly for manatees. So oftentimes when we see an orphan stranded having lost its mother, they are almost always in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's exactly what happened to Brandy. She was in water so cold that her body had started to shut down, had stopped pumping warm blood to her tail, and that tissue was dying off. The good news is, however, she was rescued. 
She was fixed up in the hospital, and she's here now, which is always a good sign. In order to come to rehab, the vet at the hospital has to give a manatee a clean bill of health. They can't come to us, in other words, if they still need regular veterinary care. She is over 600 pounds now. The minimum release weight for a young orphan manatee is between 700 and 800 pounds, depending on the time of year in which they're released. And so she actually has a tentative release date scheduled for February of this coming year. So we're really excited. Hopefully, Brandy's going to get a shot to be a wild manatee really soon again. Uh, little Charlie over here in the middle, that's Brandy. Charlie's just over 400 pounds. He's been with us about a month and a half. Charlie was found with his mother. Charlie's mother had such a severe boat injury and also a nursing dependent calf. They figured she wouldn't make it, and not only would she not make it then, but her calf who was dependent on her for resources would also not make it. They rescued the pair, took them to the hospital. Charlie's mother unfortunately did pass away fairly quickly from her boat strike injury, but the good news was that Charlie was already in the hospital and set to receive care. He is doing very well, like I said, over 400 pounds now, but he did have to be weaned by humans onto solid foods. Now, that's one of those things that gets really tricky. He had to be weaned onto solid foods by humans, but if he goes out into the wild thinking humans need food, he's going to get into trouble. So he's likely going to spend a long time here in rehab, unlearning a couple of the things he needed to learn in order to get strong and healthy in the hospital. He's also only 400 something pounds, and like I said earlier, he has to be at least 700 to 800. So Charlie's going to be here in rehab for quite a while, maybe even a couple of years. We're excited to have him. All right, it's your turn, Snooty. You guys might be wondering. Why, if it's illegal to hand feed wild manatees, why I'm up here shoveling food into Snooty's mouth, who's obviously begging for more? <laughs> the answer to that is what I said earlier. Snooty is not a wild manatee. <laughs> Snooty doesn't even pretend to be a wild manatee. <laughs> it turns out Snooty's never even seen the wild. So really, really isn't a wild manatee. Never was. It used to be that you could get permission from the state to go, thank you for that. You could get permission from the state to go out and capture a healthy manatee to put on exhibit in an aquarium or a museum. Nowadays, that's illegal. The only manatees that come in are done so by Florida Fish and Wildlife and prepared for release in the future. So no more healthy manatees are being captured from the wild right now. However, when it was legal, two fishermen in Miami, they got their permission for one. They went out and captured their one manatee, a healthy female named Lady, and everything went smoothly except for one tiny detail. And by tiny, I mean 65-pound detail. She was pregnant. One day, they came into their one manatee-only aquarium, and instead, they had two. Baby Snooty was born. That was the morning of July 21st, 1948. So if you guys do your math, you figure out that two days ago, we celebrated Snoopy's 63rd birthday. Yay! <laughs> that is the record. That makes him the oldest manatee to have ever lived, either in the wild or in captivity, as far as we know. We like to call him an ambassador for his species, because pretty much everything we know about manatees, we've learned during Snoopy's lifetime. And a lot of it, especially caring for them in captivity, we've learned directly from him over the last 63 years. Yeah. Well, in 1948, we knew nothing about caring for infant manatees in captivity, as in less than nothing. There were no experts to consult. No one had done it successfully before. So ladies handlers did exactly what they thought best. No kale right now, okay? How about less? Let's just go. So ladies handlers did exactly what they thought best. They scooped up baby Snooty here, they bottle fed him, and they even slept next to his tank at night to make sure if he needed anything, they would be there. And while he obviously grew up nice and strong and healthy, he also obviously grew up with a nice, strong, healthy dependency on human care. He was not spending very much time with his real manatee mother there in his captive environment after birth. Instead, he very quickly demonstrated his intense dependency on humans. So he was deemed non-releasable at only a couple months old down there in Miami. The problem then was, 
However, that he couldn't return to the wild because he'd been deemed non releasable, but he also couldn't stay at that small one manatee only aquarium. So in 1949, we got our permission to have one healthy manatee in captivity, and Snooty came up here at nine months old. He's been with us ever since. The tank you see here was built for him in 1993. It's actually 60,000 gallons, equipped to be comfortable for three adult manatees, and so Snooty's been hosting or sharing this tank with rescue rehabs like Brandy and Charlie here since 1998, and they are numbers 21 and 22 on the list of manatees that Snooty's helped to prepare for release. So it turns out he makes a good host as well. Can you roll over and show off that belly for everyone, please? Good job. <laughs> now because Snooty was deemed non-releasable because he is a permanent resident here, and because he's 63 years old, we're not going to change things up on him now. We're going to continue to give him the unique sort of care that's kept him a record-breaking number of years happy and healthy. However, it's very important to recognize that a wild manatee handled in this way would have very, very small, a very small chance of surviving in the wild. So that's wild manatee care. This is not so wild manatee care. <laughs> very, very important to realize that Snoopy's unique and Snooty most likely would not survive a couple hours in the wild. People also always ask me, think he'd make it a day? And I said, no, I don't think he'd make it two hours. So definitely we don't want to be handling wild manatees, not only because it's illegal, but because we know for sure now, just based on mortality reports, that a manatee handled like that just once in a while, they learn all kinds of things that lead them into trouble on a daily basis here. So we get pretty lucky with Snooty. We want to make sure all the other ones are out there keeping track of the wild populations. Right now, the average age of death in the wild for Floridian manatee is between 5 and 10 years old. Snooty's 63, happy and healthy. Beth says he's not necessarily an old age manatee. We don't know what old age is for a manatee yet. That's how bad it is in the wild for manatees is that it is 2011 and we still don't know what old age looks like for a manatee because they have not been given a chance to live their whole lifespan in our world. So we really, really need to protect the wild ones and that's why we owe you all a huge thank you. Without you coming to support us here and supporting us at this aquarium, we would not be able to afford to do rehabilitation for wild manatees here. So we all, you, we owe all of you a huge, huge thank you because obviously manatees like Brandy and Charlie need our help, need to get back out there and have babies in the wild so we can still have Florida manatees in the future. So thank you all so much. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> Feel free to hang out. Snooty is obviously still hungry, so that means I'm stuck here feeding him. So if you guys think of a question and want to shout it out, I'm here as long as you need me to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Enjoy your visit to the Southwater Museum. Good job. Good job. How often do you have to bring food out here? All day long. These guys are grazers as opposed to mealers, especially the growing ones. They don't need access to food around the clock, pretty yeah. much 24 hours a day like they would have in the wild. Right now, we're feeding about 200 to 250 pounds of vegetation to a tank a day. 